this has been um, one of my favorite topics. I have been studying Bowlies of Delhi for last 11 years now. I started in 2009. Uh, it was 24th October 2009. I even remember the date. Uh, I went to this small part of Delhi called Mehroli. And in Mehroli, there is a very beautiful step well of Bauli uh, called Rajoki Bauli. We'll be talking about it in detail later. But when I saw it for the first time, I was surprised and amazed at the same time. I had no idea because while walking on the ground, you don't get to see anything. It's just like uh, it's, it's vast open land, uh, you know, for till wherever you can see. And all of a sudden, at one point of time, uh, you know, at one point you stop and then you see there are steps leading down and you keep going uh, down and uh, secrets reveal. The kind of secrets that I'm going to discuss today, what exactly is a Bauli, how it functions. A quick definition. So Bauli, in most simple words, is a subterranean structure and it is used to fetch water from underground aquifers. Now we know uh, about wells, Pue. The wells are there and when you create steps leading to the water level inside the well, it becomes a step well. In uh, Delhi, we call it Bauli. Uh, you go to Haryana, you call it Bavadi. You go to Rajasthan, you go to Gujarat, names change. In Rajasthan, at some place, uh, it's called Bavadi. In Haryana, uh, sorry, in Gujarat, it's called Vau. Karnataka, Vapika, different names. You, in different areas, we have different names to it. But the concept is same, which has been there since the days of Harappan civilization, where we find great baths, though uh, we still have to figure out that were all the great baths or those big tanks actually connected to underground aquifers or they were water storage tanks. So that may vary case to case. However, today our focus is on uh, the steppels of Delhi, how they function and what exactly they had. Uh, here's a quick diagram that I've used in my book also. Uh, this shows how a bauli is constructed or underground how the bauli is. So on the top you have the ground level. I'll use a marker. This will be better. On the top we have uh, the ground level and then usually what happens is the way this bauli is constructed or even a well is constructed. They would create a wooden frame and they would keep it here. Before they start their work, the first step is to create a wooden frame, a circular wooden frame, a hollow frame, something like this. Um, you know, okay, my drawing is not very good. I shouldn't be doing it too much. Um, a wooden frame and put it on the top, of, you know, on ground, and they would start clearing mud from uh, inside that circle. Now, once they have created a pit, they would push that wooden frame down. And as they keep going down, they would keep pushing that wooden frame down and adding layers to it. So what happens is, uh, over here when they have this wooden frame, as they start going down, the wooden frame has reached this level and they have already added more either wooden frames or stone brick walls, something around this, which prevents the side uh, mud to collapse in. So this well, as they go down, it won't collapse. And that's very important. So when the water, they reach the water level, which first they reach the unconfined aquifer. Unconfined aquifer is something which is rainwater. Uh, whenever it rains, unconfined aquifers fill. And then you go further. You reach the confined aquifer, which is the actual water table. So usually wells are constructed during non-rainy seasons. So that you don't find anything in unconfined aquifer, you can reach directly to confined aquifer and you can get water all through the year. Once you reach this level, after rainy season, there are enough uh, water pockets created outside, you know, within one season that now uh, the water level in the well will rise up high. And then they would create steps and a tank attached to the well. Now, one interesting thing that I found in all these step wells in Delhi, there are two to three exceptions. I'll talk about them separately. But wherever we have a separate well and a separate tank, they would have a small window between well and tank tank can at most fetch water from unconfined aquifer, but it will never enter or penetrate the confined aquifer. Water through well reaches tank or the basin. And this surprised me because I always thought that in that case, I mean, why do you first of all need two separate, uh, uh, you know, well separate and tank separate? 
So then I started studying it. Then I started talking to people. In Delhi, nobody knew, even historians, architects, archaeologists, they had no idea. They said, okay, this was the design. This is how they did. Then I turned to remote villages of Haryana and Punjab, where people still used wells and tanks and ponds, lakes. I started talking to these people, go, going there, sitting with them, trying to understand how does life function around a well or a tank and then whatever I learned from there actually explained whatever I was able to uh, see in Delhi. When you use the tank or the basin, this is for bathing. So tanks are used for bathing. Now when you are bathing in a tank, uh, this water will get dirty. And if you want to drink this water, that's, that's, that's not advised. So this particular area gets dirty water and in a while that all that dirt or whatever is there settles over here in this whole area. They would keep window a little higher so that this dirty water cannot go back into well. And this water, water in well is always used for drinking. So tank water is used for bathing, washing, all kind of chores and well water is used for drinking. Then uh, another question that uh, why doesn't this dirty water, because water is water, water stays at the same level. That's a simple physics principle. Water has to stay at the same level. That's how water is going from well to tank. If water is coming from well to tank, dirty water can go back. Why is it not going back? So I turned back to my old school history books and I found out that it's a simple principle of physics. Pressure is inversely proportional to surface area. I have lesser surface area over here, which means there is more pressure. Here surface area is more, so less pressure, which means water can travel or all the impurities or purities, whatever there is, can travel in one direction because we have pressure from this side. So everything is coming this side and nothing is going back unless someone starts jumping over here, dancing over here and whatever is settled, the sludge that is settled at this basin gets mixed up and all this water is spoiled. And since someone is, uh, you know, jumping or disturbing water in this particular zone, then a little bit might spill over into the well. And once that happens, everybody is told to stay away from tank or well until this dust or mud, whatever is mixed in it settles. So that's another rule. So whenever you go to a village pond, you would see if the buffaloes are bathing, Nobody is bathing right next to the buffaloes. As in, even if they are kids, they just have fun. They would, they don't mind. But normally what they do is once buffaloes bathe and they come out, there is so much of dirt in there, which is unsettled because of the buffaloes that have walked through uh, the basin. Then they would wait for some time so that everything settles. And then anybody can fetch that water because whatever mud is there, it will also pull all the impurities and everything will settle down. And you will get water on top, which is bathable or you can be used for anything. This gave birth to one more very interesting thing. Uh, interesting concept. That is, you cannot bathe, you cannot wash your hair on certain days. You cannot wash your clothes on certain days. Why so? Because when you are washing your hair or washing your clothes, you are using certain types of plants or herbs. Uh, you have shikaka, you have amla, you're putting in your hair. Now that creates a, a oily kind of sludgy layer on the top. So if someone has just washed her hair or his hair and all that uh, leftover is on this water and some other person comes and tries to wash their clothes, clothes instead of getting clean would rather get dirty. So they decided days. That on certain days we will do this thing, on certain days we will do this thing. So that's how culture started developing around these step wells. Another interesting thing I found was, and this is still practiced in many areas in uh, uh, India, at least the villages, is this is my personal experience. I was, this is from 1995 or 96. I was a kid, we went to Punjab. And there is this one place where we had a step well, step tank rather. So it was the well, the basin was not separate, 
the well was the basin because they were not using this water for drinking and steps were leading down to the basin from all side it's part of a gurudwara near ludhiana and that that is the holy sarovar so me my mother my aunt and my younger sister so two kids and two elder ladies we were there uh, it was time around noon and we were just uh, washing our hand and feet and all of a sudden my aunt my bua ji she shouted on top of her lungs that please come in and i was surprised that out of blue all of a sudden there is nobody you know we are the only four people that i can see in here and we are what 70 feet or 60 feet underground it's a huge open space though we have come down through steps and now uh, who are you calling and who are you calling in she said there are two people standing up there 60 feet high or 50 feet high and they just coughed <coughs> like this i couldn't notice that but she noticed so i said but why are you calling them if someone is standing there and coughing why are you calling them here she said no this is something this is something that happens because these two men they want to come and have water but the noon time or uh, time between 10 am to 3 pm 4 pm is always reserved for ladies anywhere you go in punjab so she only said punjab because she knew about that area but i have experienced this in haryana also and i know about up also and i'm sure that this was the practice in other areas as well she said uh, noon or the, the afternoon time dopahar ka time is reserved for ladies so men will not come near water they will come to the closest point where they cannot see anyone uh, around the pond or lake and they will make some sort of noise to tell the people that there is a male presence and if the ladies are bathing or washing they'll just call them in if they can if not they'll say okay wait there you need water we'll fetch some water and we'll give it to you so that used to be the practice and if they don't hear anyone reply then they can walk in then they can use uh, the water basin uh, the water tank or whatever the source is so there was this unwritten law a practice that uh, happened there which ensured that there was proper privacy for men and women at certain times they when they were using the water this kind of thing is almost gone nobody even talks about uh this kind of respect that we we were giving to our own society back then so while doing my research on step wells of delhi baulis i have learned so many things so much of science so much of um, uh culture that has changed with time since we stopped respecting these underground structures now uh, okay farooq is asking uh, are step wells peculiar uh, only to the indian subcontinent if not where else can one see these we have a few in europe as well there is this website by philip uh, stepwells.org where he is trying to map every single stepwell on this planet so we have we have seen one or two in american uh, continent so i was saying that we have lost so much of our uh, cultural aspect that uh, used to prevail back in those days and just because we no longer uh follow these practices things have changed when you go to rajasthan you would see that they the well step wells over there are square in shape and they are very deep there is another science behind that for that let me first show you this now these are few uh, top elevations uh, i haven't covered all the baulis and delhi these are those baulis which i have covered in my book so out of 32 33 baulis that delhi has Uh, my book covers about 12 though the title of the book is top 10 baulis so i've used uh, architectural diagram of the 10 baulis uh, that are there now these are top elevations and if you notice carefully most of these baulis have an entrance from the northern side there are uh, three exceptions one is kotla firosha bauli one is agrasen ki bauli and one is purana kila bauli these three baulis have entrance from the southern side or east west now uh, in these three cases the tank is covered i think i should pause for a minute there is loud noise in the background or uh, uh, is if if the if this loud no sound is not distracting i can continue no it's not distracting it's not distracting it's not distracting we can continue So there is this municipality vehicle that comes every day at eleven thirty, 
<laughs> like I said, the sweet ambience of real India. Okay, uh, talking about uh, the architecture, the orientation of a step well. That's very important, especially in a place like Delhi and around Delhi, what I've seen, why all the Baulis have their entrance with steps leading down from north to south is because we are in northern hemisphere of this planet. When you say northern hemisphere, that simply means, uh, yeah. that simply means that sun that moves from east to west goes like this. So it makes this kind of arc which means that sunlight will never fall directly on the tank. Which means if I go to this slide, sun even at noon will not be on top. It will rather be over here, somewhere here. So sunlight will fall like this, slanting rays and not straight from top, which means that more than half of tank at any, any given point of day or at any se given any season will remain under shade. So the water will not evaporate, the water will not heat up. Rooms, they, were, they constructed rooms around the structure, around the water tank, which always, uh, they were, because of the moisture that the surrounding walls in the building held, because of that uh, also the temperature was uh, reduced. And given this particular orientation, the temperature always, the water temperature was always less than what you would get if you had kept that water outside. Baulis that had different orientation like Agrasen Ki Bauli, Purana Kila Bauli, they had to cover the tank. So this is the covered portion. So in here, uh, and this is covered. All others, in all other cases, tanks are open from top. Frosha Kota is completely covered or it used to be completely covered from top. So that's one difference. Again, simple physics. Can we revive these baulis? This is one question which people have been asking me. I have, you know, wherever uh, they call me for an interview recently, Delhi Jail Board, the, the water department of Delhi government, they invited me. We had multiple meetings, multiple discussions. They were very keen to revive all the step wells in Delhi. And I simply told them that you guys are wasting your and my time because I know you will not be able to do it because of the political uh, unwillingness that we have. So the minister, the water minister or the secretary or the chairman who were sitting over there, they were very much interested in doing uh, this revival, but they cannot. Why? Because to fetch water from a step well, so you clean the step well, water will re uh, return to that step well. Right now, most of the wells are dried up. Even if the water returns, what will happen? You have to put pipe to pump it out. The pipe has to go through a piece of land. So pipe has to enter ASI monument, which is center government. It has to go through a land, which is municipal corporation, which is not the party, which is ruling over Delhi right now, or maybe Delhi development authority, which is also not the party that is ruling right now in Delhi. And then it reaches a pumping station. So you have to build a pumping station somewhere. And then this is groundwater in Delhi. The groundwater is already so polluted. You cannot fetch and consume it. You have to set up a proper cleaning unit. You know, uh, if you fetch groundwater and leave that uh, hose pipe somewhere in, in the lawn, within 10 minutes, you can see that there is a froth that accumulates around the water where it is exiting. So our water, uh, groundwater in Delhi is so impure, so polluted that even if I fetch water normally and, to, uh, you know, try to water my plants, even those plants won't survive. There are only a few areas, actually three baulis in Delhi, Around those areas, water is still in a better shape. They are right next to Yamuna, where you can still use water from, uh, you know, you can fetch underground water and use it. But a little far off the river, water is not usable. So we had the discussion. I said, all these uh, Baulis, since different agencies are managing the Bauli area around the Bauli and the water that has to come out, it's more of a hassle and less of a benefit. Another problem is the AMASR Act. The Monuments Act that we have states that you cannot uh, do anything which uh, kind of uh, interferes with the aesthetic of a monument. So you cannot destroy the structure or uh, modify the structure and you can also not alter the aesthetics. So if you try to create a, a, you know, a slit in the wall and 
put pipe inside the wall that is not allowed because then you are destroying the monument you cannot put pipes outside also because that will disturb the aesthetic value so in a in in a way there is no automated method to fetch water and you can't have someone coming and filling buckets and going out worst you can't leave water as it is if you clean it if the water returns you can't leave it as it is because then that water will go bad it will spoil it will start rotting and that will create another health hazard to people living uh, in that area around that area another challenge is the catchment area the photograph that you see right now is of agrasen ki bauli it's in kanot place and this photograph was taken before kanot place was built you can see huge open space around this right now all we have is a 30 to 40 feet space outside this uh, wall where a small portion is part of the bauli complex and then there is a 20 feet wide road i mean in actually not even 20 feet it's it's less it's hardly 15 feet and then a huge row of buildings and on the other side buildings are touching right this wall so no space at all so there is no catchment area the idea behind a step well is that it fetches water from the underground water table so the water has to reach underground table when it rains the water has to go underground with all the carpeted roads and concrete jungles that we have built whatever water is falling from sky it's we have put pipes and we are pushing all that water directing it to the uh, steamer lines which is further taken down to yamuna river with and that to its pumped back in back into yamuna outside delhi so within delhi even in yamuna we are not letting our water go into yamuna within delhi it once yamuna crosses delhi at the border is where we give it its water back or whatever water we are getting from uh, rainfall so we don't allow our water table to recharge and that is another reason that water table in delhi is has gone so down so how do you revive a bauli because if you clean everything water is not there water is further 30 feet deep and you cannot dig it up further because for that you have to destroy the structure once you have made a well or a step well there is a limit to which you can uh, further dig it up which in these cases is not possible so reviving a bauli is possible theoretically but practically there are so many challenges all it needs is a very strong political will because if the political will is there then i think this is possible without that and all the agencies come together on one table and agree with each other which usually in india never happens uh, but if that happens only then this can be revived so that's about the revival uh, now let's uh, have a look at all the baulis that we have in delhi one by one uh, let me start with feroz shah kotla feroz shah tughlaq is considered to be the father of irrigation system of india he has done lot of work in terms of revival of uh, water structures he constructed new canals and he made sure that his entire uh, uh, country whichever uh, whatever area he ruled everybody had access to not only water but whatever they needed so he built karamasarais he built all kind of public utility buildings and his construction was unique for example look at this one photograph this is a circular bauli a round structure and this is in ferosha kotla uh, behind this you can see this high mast light which is of the ferosha kotla stadium so in delhi whenever you say ferosha kotla people think of the stadium but ferosha kotla kotla means fortress so the kotla of ferosha or the fortress of ferosha is what gives name to that stadium also and it is behind that stadium originally it was on the bank of river yamuna now yamuna has changed its course by half a kilometer gone a little away this step well which at that time was just 200 meters away from the river bank has got multiple terracotta pipes that during conservation our archaeologists were able to find they discovered that in fact british only discovered that at that time when they were trying to clean it up and these uh, terracotta pipes ha had they had linked it in such a way that water from uh, this whole garden was also reaching into this and there was overflow channel that whenever water because this is underground and totally covered structure inside a palace they had made all that arrangement that when water reaches a level it will automatically go out and fall in yamuna river 
this is the uh, this is how it was on the top this portion is all gone now these chhatris that you see are all gone these steps leading upstairs only one side steps uh, on one of these steps uh, over here and on the other side are left everything else is gone and under that so this is your ground level under that these two levels they still exist there are chambers rooms only the arches exist proper rooms and the roof that was there the railing everything is now gone with time this is how it looks these days and here you see these ugly pipes which are fetching water and uh, the lawn of rosha kotlai gets water from this bauli only these pipes have been here since the british time and so asi continue they just repair they they have installed new pipes when required otherwise the same thing continued we also have old pipes running which were there uh, in the british period those pipes are also here and new pipes just came in and there are uh, three step wells actually two in which you see these ugly pipes everywhere else water is stagnant we are not fetching water out so there used to be a roof or a floor over here and a roof on top with a small opening in the center this is when we get down so the first photograph is the of, of the steps leading down to the basement the water level these are the pillars that are holding it and uh, at times i have gone inside so when you look at this photograph these are rather new photographs uh, latest ones which i clicked just before the publishing of my book all the photographs that you will see today are from my book only uh, water level was high so i was not able to go into the towards the tank because water had filled this underground room also from where the steps were leading down so i'm actually standing at the last step i'm last two steps i'm not even uh, at the floor water had come inside level was high this is an old photograph from 1923 of uh, this step well from outside so all those steps leading up they're all you can see they're all gone next up is the bauli of redford another unique structure inside redford one doesn't even notice that this exists and this is a l shaped bauli this is also from the period of firosha tughlaq which predates redford by 3 centuries so bauli was built during firosha tughlaq 300 years later when shah jahan came and started building his fort this bauli was incorporated into the fort and became part of the fort and it was renovated then so this is how it is it has got uh, entrance from two sides there is a tank well on this side there are underground chambers and on one side the underground chambers were converted to prison cells i'll talk about it so this is how it looks there are corridors that take you from the tank to well and to underground chambers uh uh farooq is asking were any of the bowlies damaged during the construction of delhi metro this one this one actually it was not actually damaged what happened because whenever they constructed metro they had to take permission from archaeological survey of india and many other agencies wherever they constructed metro and when they were uh, constructing the red fort line they the permission that they had was good enough to keep it away from the monuments and no harm was to be done to the monument however what happened that by mistake they punctured one of the aquifers so all these bowlies and wells everything is connected underground through water channels the underground rivers that we say so one of the aquifers was punctured and all that water was drained and filled in the tunnel that they were digging up and this bowly within a matter of day or two it was all dried up when that happened immediately not just this bauli or there are two more baulis uh, not too far from this place they were dried up and immediately they took action and within 3 months everything was back to normal they repaired that uh, patch they uh, fixed it and within 3 months water also returned and then i was able to click this picture so i've got one picture of uh, that dried up also i don't know if i have it in this presentation i don't think it's here uh, i'll i'll search it separately if i have time later I'll, i can show you now during british time what happened this is the well so during british time they had put girders in here and created a floor 
and there were small openings on the floor that came up because it, it, this this whole thing is very weak and it was it is broken from in between so this is just to hold it these pipes are actually to uh, protect this structure from further damage or collapse but one can actually go here and see how this well is from inside few views of the step well now while you are walking on this lawn on the on the top you may not notice that there is something like this unless you come closer and you actually look how deep it is that's when you get proper picture of this place and this is with all the step wells from outside they are nothing it's just plain land now these are the prison cells that i'm talking about these prison cells were created in 1945 so in 1945 as the world war is about to end the british were able to capture three generals of indian national army shah nawaz hussain gurbakh singh tillo and prem sagal these three people were brought to red fort and uh, their trial started and since they were uh, the british were not sure where to keep them what the british did they came to this step well they got metal girders and over here they placed all the metal girders so no one can go beyond this point so this became a floor from the other side you have access to the tank from this side this is the limit and they installed bricks they sealed these arches created a small room inside they also have a makeshift toilet and a pantry on on the other side they have the pantry and this is where the three generals were kept before they started constructing a proper prison for them so there is another fort behind red fort so if you ever come to delhi and uh, you cross this uh, bauli there is a gate called salimgarh gate one of the gates of red fort it takes you to the fort of salimgarh which is more than 100 years older than actually 150 years older than red fort so there used to be an island in center of river yamuna on that island salim shah suri the emperor he built a fort to uh, uh, protect delhi from the invasion of humayun who was now charging back to claim his territory but eventually they all fell and then uh, the mughals took over it and that fort was connected to red fort via a bridge and that fort had always acted uh, at point at times it acted as a prison for the mughals so aurangzeb in uh, confined his own daughter to that fort there are other examples that we have and later mughal emperors they used that fort as their pleasure house so inside the red fort a lot of people would come to meet the emperor and whenever emperor wanted to rest he would just walk down cross the bridge go to that fort and nobody was allowed to enter that fort so he would sit there relax now in that fort we have that prison that british built and until then these cells were used and there are two barracks that british built which are still there just for these three soldiers and a, a, a small unit was stationed there to guard these three men these three generals at that time there was this one slogan which became very popular lal kile se utthi awaaz sahgal dhillo shah nawaz that uh, free these three people pandit jawaharlal nehru amongst many other were the lawyers who were fighting uh, from the ins side and they were trying to get these people free the case popularly known as the red fort trial do read about it amazing uh, uh, debate you will read over there uh, it's 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 available not just on wikipedia but if you want there are court records also available of this what kind of discussion debate they were happening because earlier these people were part of british army and then they joined indian national army so uh, many things including treason they were charged with so it was happening the court martial was happening and pandit nehru ji and amongst others were trying to defend them it went on for almost a year year and a half and by that time the british had already declared that we will free india we will uh, grant independence to india and these people continued in the jail until independence and immediately after independence the three generals were set free and whatever they had their material their uniforms weapons everything they were requested to give to indian government and these three rooms or two rooms they decided so in, inside it is just one room over here what you see in this picture and there are there is one room on other side uh, indian government said that we will create a museum inside this room if you can give us your stuff so they gave captain lakshmi sagal and all they also gave their stuff but there was a problem because there were a lot of snakes over here and there was so much dampness 
that you can't keep uniform and weapons, pistols and all in this room. So instead, the barracks in the Salimgarh fort that I just mentioned, that was converted to a museum. And all their stuff, their belongings are right now in that museum. Uh, for last about one year, that museum is uh, locked because of some restoration happening uh, in the Salimgarh fort and the bridge that connects the Salimgarh fort. But otherwise, uh, that museum was open to public. So that's about Red Fort. The most interesting thing about Red Fort Step Well, which I enjoy the most, is the well, which if you, if you look at uh, which picture will have, yeah, this one. So look at this portion. There is a very small structure, a kind of wall around the well. And on the two sides, the outside uh, portion, we have huge arches inside this. So this is not a very high wall. This is hardly uh, six feet. So we have two arches on the two sides, the sides that we cannot see from here. And in these arches, in one of the arches, we have a temple. In one of the arches, we have a grave. That's something which uh, fascinates me. Or uh, uh, these things have come up either during the... Uh, when the British army was inside, the Indian soldiers may have installed these structures and there is a possibility that the Indian army did it. We don't know. No, they, I was not able to find any document which talks about these. So maybe Indian army did. And when Indian army vacated the Red Fort, this particular uh, shrine was given to CISF, which is right now maintaining Red Fort. And they properly maintain these two makeshift shrines. So this is inside, within the structure of the step well, the Bauli of Red Fort. Now we move to another Bauli in Delhi, which is called the Ridge Bauli. Now, whatever names I'm taking, these are not the original names or whenever these Baulis were constructed. Actually, we have not found any name. So that, may, that tells us that officially these Baulis were not named. But over a period of time, they gained some or other name because of some or other reason. For example, this one we call Ridge Bauli because it falls in Delhi Ridge near North Campus University of, uh, of uh, North Campus of Delhi University. And right now it is inside the complex of Hindu Rao Hospital. So in uh, Northern Delhi, we have Hindu Rao Hospital. Inside the complex, we have this. This used to be another palace of uh, Firosha Tughlaq. And within that palace, there used to be this Bauli. A small portion of the palace still exists. There used to be a tunnel that connected this Bauli and the circular Bauli that I've shown you, uh, the Firosha Kotla Bauli. This tunnel was found by the British. The architecture or the structure, whatever remains, is quite interesting. And it's, it's, uh, rather, it rather gives a very majestic look. This is that Pir Ghaib, the observatory of Firosha Tughlaq, the old palace to which this Bauli was connected. And this is the house of the famous Maratha Hindu Rao, after whom this whole complex is now named. William Fraser lived here, later Hindu Rao uh, lived here uh, during 1857 mutiny. This house was one of the important sites. It was damaged also. Uh, right now, this is a medical institute and the main hospital <coughs> is the building connected to this. So this goes into continuation and this is the new building which is right next to the house. The controller of the examination of medical exams for this uh, medical college sits in this complex. Earlier it was plastic ward and now it's the examination office. The main hospital is in this building now, right next to it. This is when I first saw this step well in 2011. That's how it was. And this is in 2016 and 17. So after uh, restoration, the, it came out beautifully. And this green layer that you see on water, this is not dirty. This is by far the cleanest step well that I've seen, at least in Delhi. This water was so uh, clean that I could see uh, a, even the pebbles at the, you know, at the at the bottom. And the layer that you see is the plant that grow on water, it's just not harmful. It helps and it helps in the, you know, although this particular step well does not have fishes, but had there been fishes, they would have survived because of this green layer only. We don't know exactly where the tunnel would have been, 
because the british when they found that tunnel they documented it they went in for uh, half a kilometer or so and they said that now it is going so uh, it has become so tight and uh, it's risky so what they did they sealed that tunnel but this is the only probability from where the tunnel could have been because otherwise in the wall we don't see any other place where uh, you know i can guess that any tunnel could have been made another important step well in delhi is hazrat nizamuddin ki bauli khwaja nizamuddin aulia is uh, the successor of khwaja muinuddin chishti of ajmer so in ajmer we have the dargah khwaja muinuddin chishti in the chishtiya silsila the chishti order of sufism next we have khwaja qutubuddin bakhtiyar kaki who is also buried in delhi in his shrine we also have a bauli which i will show towards the end of this presentation and after him is khwaja fariduddin ganj shakar or baba farid whose bani is also in uh, guru granth sahib so he is also very important for six after baba farid we have hazrat nizamuddin aulia whose shrine is one of the most famous shrines in india and in delhi the step well that is there in nizamuddin near nizamuddin darga is considered to be sacred this step well also is the tank and the well is same so we don't have a separate well tank is the well and uh, recently aga khan foundation when they restored this step well they found the old wooden structure still at the base which was used to dig up the well because first the well was dig then the steps were created from uh, 1902 to 1919 i've got these photographs from archaeological archives and today this is how the step well looks now let's move to the most famous step well of delhi which is agrasen ki bauli it is sometimes spelled with a u sometimes with a again another fascinating story how why u why a architecture is also quite interesting because this is one of the few step wells where you have steps leading to different levels through the walls there are i think uh, two or three step wells where inside the walls you have multiple steps for multiple levels and then there are tunnels you can move from one chamber to another one section to another from within the walls and nobody would even notice all of a sudden you are walking and you just hide uh, drift a little bit and you are gone and then you appear somewhere on the totally opposite side because internally everything is connected then there is a mosque on one side this is how this bauli was in early 20th century when you know british came and they marked this area for construction of connaught place some more archival photographs these are the steps this is after restoration these are the steps which are inside the wall so now what asi did asi has installed these gates because people were misusing and misusing these uh, alleys and anyone there was a risk also that anyone can fall in from anywhere but back in the days when this it was all open i was able to explore this so like this all of a sudden you are walking here and these are the steps leading up from here we have steps leading down talking of the name the officially officially the name is ugrasen ki bauli and people say it is associated with maharaja agrasen uh that became a lot of a matter of debate because agrasen directly is not associated with delhi he is though associated with agra where he established agra one and all in delhi it is said that uh, some people started believing that maharaja agrasen built this bauli though this bauli is also from um, tughlaq period originally and later it was repaired uh, the area was called jaisingpura or narhola which was the estate of maharaja of jaipur uh, so one theory is that probably someone from the agrawal community constructed this bauli and that's how it got its name agrasen ki bauli and the mosque exists next to this bauli because uh, there was a lot of muslim population so this person must have built a mosque attached to it earlier they were doing that muslims were building temples hindus are building mosques depending on whatever the population density in that area is this bauli became famous through the movie pk because in pk amir khan lives in this bauli 
so all of a sudden this bowli became so famous people started flocking to this place and earlier uh, when we used to go 10 years back you would hardly find anyone you can go there sit there for hours and in the hustle bustle of connaught place one of the busiest markets of delhi all of a sudden you enter you go underground there is absolutely no background noise or no honking or shouting of people in one tiny lane you have entered in sitting 40 feet 50 feet underground in complete silence this was rather a place where people like me love to go amongst few other bawlis but now even this place is so much crowded because of that one movie the picture that you see over here which i have taken of the tank this one so i'm standing in the tank which is now all dried up and i have clicked the ceiling and this one photograph is probably the toughest photograph i have ever taken why because this was the morning time uh, uh rather i think rang de basanti rang de basanti was not shot here rang de basanti was shot in a karewa sarai near ludhiana and that sarai is still known as rdb sarai or rang de basanti sarai uh, and uh, or although the official name is sarai lashkari khan over there also you have this kind of structure but not exactly like this but obviously people often get confused if one or two shots were uh, from here maybe yes i have not uh, I, i don't recall if there was any scene from this bawli also but mostly it was uh, sarai lashkari khan of uh, uh, near ludhiana so coming back to this the shot was difficult because it was morning time and bats were all you know bats live in this particular uh, chamber so it was morning time when they would go to sleep and before going to sleep they would relieve themselves so it was actually raining bat poop and when i entered i could see all those drops falling in black drops and uh, you know i just picked up my camera i took my position and i was outside so i took my position i stepped inside took two steps came in the center tick 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 click four five pictures and came out it was all over within 5 to 7 seconds i didn't take more than that within that time only my uh, kurta my camera it was all dressed in bat poop and then i just came home luckily i was on my bike that day not in my car otherwise my car would have because bat poop stinks like anything you one cannot tolerate especially when it is on you came home and that day the way i bathe i have i don't think i have taken bath like that ever before rubbing myself like anything because that smell was not going off so this is by far my toughest picture and that was the last picture i took for my book after this immediately the book went into publishing a uh, few pictures of uh, whatever is remaining of the mosque so uh, munir ka bawli also uh, cause a little bit little bit of trouble for me because there is this one town called munirka or village called munirka in delhi popular one in south delhi so when i read about munirka bawli i went there i parked my car outside i went inside the village i explored that entire village looked into every single street went there multiple times i did not found, find this bawli so i thought okay maybe the bawli is gone then while uh, reading one other document one day i found out that during the times of indira gandhi a large portion around munirka was uh, given um, uh, or was decided or marked to construct government quarters and a new name was given to that area which was ramakrishna puram rk puram and since a part of munirka the land outside munirka's main village became rk puram i thought why don't i give it a try and i went to rk puram and started exploring i found all those lost monuments from my list which were tagged in munirka even today if you go to the website of archaeological survey of india they are marked as the monuments in munirka but now they are in rk puram because the name changed in 1970 our lists have not changed since 1920 actually small structure very beautiful again there are steps within the wall uh, just a double story structure with a small well this well itself has a few steps leading down there are two turrets on the top and within these turrets we have winding staircase which brings you down to this level and then there is a corridor this corridor that you see so turrets open into these into this corridor you can you can walk here 
go up, come down. Very quiet, uh, serenic place. In the morning and evening, you would see people doing yoga, sitting in one corner, relaxing. So this is the Bauli. Now this is one interesting uh, thing that we found. There is this aqueduct which appears to be, uh, when I looked into the masonry, it appeared to be a later addition. Now what this aqueduct is, look, at, look over here, the, the picture below this. You see these two stone pieces, the leftovers, which you can see over here also. So this is the broken portion. There used to be a bigger stone piece and there was a proper wooden structure on this. Through this wooden structure, they would fetch water and they would just throw that water on the side of this well. And there is a slope. The water will go down and there is a tank on this one side where a lot of grass is now grown. So they would just throw this water on this, uh, uh, on the sides of this well. It will, through the slope, all this water will go into this tank. It's a small tank. And through this tank, it will come into this aqueduct and come over here. So entire village can line up and uh, keep their pots lined up outside this. And only two people have to go up, start fetching water, or maybe not even people. They can have a Persian wheel kind of setup. They can, uh, or what in Northern India we call a rehet. They can have a bull or a donkey or a cow moving over here. And through that, automatically the water is getting fetched, uh, pouring out and coming through this. So they're all just fetching. So uh, this kind of setup of aqueduct, there are only two step wells in Delhi where we have aqueducts and out of that, this is one aqueduct uh, outside, uh, aqueduct outside the step well, away from the well. This is one which they constructed so that people don't have to go down and fetch water. You just stand outside. One person is working, standing next to this turret, fetching water and everybody in the village can get the water. And these are those small steps, the winding staircase that takes you down into that corridor and on the other side from within the turret. So this turret that you see, these are the steps inside it. It's very small, very congested, but quite interesting. This is the oldest step well in Delhi, the very first step well that was built. It was built by king famous as Al Tamash or Il Tutmesh, the successor of Kutubuddin Abak. So Il Tutmesh uh, considered Khwaja Kutubuddin Bakhtiar Kaki as his master, as his spiritual master, Piro Murshid. And one day Il Tutmesh went to Khwaja Kaki and saw that Khwaja Kaki is sitting in a very dissolved state. He had not taken bath, his hair are all messy, his clothes are dirty. So he asked his master that why have you not taken bath? So uh, Khwaja Kaki said that we don't get water even to drink here properly. How do you expect me to take a bath? We don't have water in this area. What The nearest tank is far from this place. So what uh, Iltitmish did, he said, immediately start digging up a step well next to this shrine. So where they had their khanka or the residence, right outside the residence, they had some open space. They started digging up this uh, step well. And when they reached the base, when water came in, they realized that they have pierced a rock rich of sulfur. So now this water is infused with sulfur, hence Gandhak ki bauli. When you have sulfur water, you cannot drink it because sulfur, sulfur water is not potable. It will have laxative effects. Aapka other than toilet mein bhi tega. So uh, the water was not fit for drinking, but sulfur, the quantity that was there in this water was perfect for skin diseases. So this bauli was seen as a miracle, as a blessing, because Khwaja Kaki mentioned that uh, I need water for bathing and the initial intention was also just for bathing. Gandak ki bauli could not be used for anything else but for bathing and even in case of bathing, it would cure your skin diseases because of the right amount of sulfur that it had. So uh, Gandak ki bauli became very famous when I first saw this step well. The architecture is interesting. One, two, three, four, five. These are the five levels and this one small portion is above the ground. So it has got these five levels and there is also an aqueduct and a tank on the side because it is so deep that people, pilgrims who would come to Khwaja Kaki's Dargah, it was not easy for any, everyone to go down and fetch water when it's dry season. So they would, uh, someone would stand at the well, fetch water, pour over here and through the slope, the water would reach this tank so that 
people who are passing from outside they can also get water this is how this bauli looks these days people people still come here they jump in they bathe in this although the water is dirty now uh, this is an old photograph where you can see the dried up bauli this is a photograph from uh, uh, university of tokyo's research that they did in delhi and here you can see that aqueduct and the tank that is being used so water was poured into uh, outside the well and from here the water would come and fill this tank so that people don't have to climb down and this they they're walking the moment they turn right is the khanka of khwaja kutub kaki behind this you can see other structures of mehrauli most of these are gone some have been encroached this jamali kamali is now a protected monument this is rajon ki bauli which is the next bauli that i am going to discuss uh, this particular structure is partially gone and this has been converted the dome uh, is now freed earlier it was encroached and this block has been converted to a mosque it's it's active mosque now this is when i saw it for the first time it was all dried up i went to the base and there was no water then slowly water started filling up because nearby another bauli was cleaned khwaja kaki's bauli and this then it got all filled up and this is that aqua that, that i was talking about uh we'll come to old fort before we go to that rajon ki bauli that i just mentioned old fort bauli has got a very interesting story so uh inside old fort of delhi which was built by sher shah suri and was originally named as shergarh uh there was a village that came up this village was called indraprasth now indraprasth village had there were there were some challenges during the british period they wanted all these people to move out due to multiple reasons one prime reason being that this area was not part of the plan of central vista the rashtrapati bhavan and latians delhi that they were planning this fort was actually part of the landscape until one of the kings decided to buy land in between which later became our national stadium until then uh, that main road which is now called rajpath originally king's way was to lead from uh, rashtrapati bhavan at that time it was viceroy house in the center there would be the great india war memorial which is now called india gate under that the cars would come take a round around that chhatri where they had statue of king george the 5th and it would come to the corner of this fort entry gate is on the other side but one of the corners and they had the straight road so all that changed when one of the kings decided to buy land which he was offered and he said i don't want my palace or my name next attached to it you make a stadium so that's how national stadium which is now called major dhyan chand uh, national stadium national hockey stadium that came up so inside this fort there was a village which was removed by the british and these people were moved to different areas uh and there was a huge garbage dump so there was a pit in which they used to dump their all their garbage when the british started clearing it up they found this it was a huge one of the deepest step wells in delhi it was all filled with garbage and nobody had an idea that this is not a pile of garbage this is actually a deep or rather the deepest step well that we have and uh, you know when they cleaned it when they restored it water came back so right be, this is the tank covered tank behind this we have the well uh, on that well we still have a small uh, room from where uh, the water is pumped out and circulated and all the the area around uh, the the lawns of the old fort get water from this well only few more pictures and that's the room i'm talking about this one this is basically a pump house on the well and it says djb when you go to the when you look at the door it's written djb that is delhi jal board the water department of delhi so this particular thing is managed by that by them and this is happening since pre independence era so everybody is comfortable and this mosque behind this uh, the kilai kuna mosque is very beautiful mosque whenever you get a chance to visit delhi make sure you that you visit this place now let's move to rajon ki bauli now when you uh, hear this name the first impression is that some king might have built it well it is not rajao ki bauli it is rajon ki bauli raje means raj mistri masons kari gar 
तो ये मिस्त्रियों की बावली है राजों की बावली बिकॉज दीज मेसन यूज टू लिव इन दीज आर्चेज दे हैड सील्ड दीज आर्चेज some of them uh, so they were having windows and some of them had doors and they made rooms inside these proper covered rooms closed rooms below uh, over here so they were all living inside and that is why this bauli this temple got its name rajon ki bauli it was built by daulat khan the governor of uh, ibrahim lodi who used to be in charge of this whole area of ludhiana and beyond up till lahore and he is the one who invited babar and this bauli was his construction to challenge the uh, lodi emperor and say and tell the lodi emperor that i am one of your most powerful nobles and that is one reason that this bauli is one of the most intricate and beautiful steppels that we see in delhi the kind of work that is done on the walls the way it is constructed is just amazing old photographs between 1908 and 1923 that i found from the archives the archaeological survey of india photo archives and then the modern photographs now that it has been restored so one portion is the facade and whatever beautification was done all the colors everything is gone a little bit survives on this side but on this side nothing nothing is left the well is a very beautiful you see these hooks on which there was a wooden frame to fetch water and uh, when i first went there i saw this all dried up like this this is the first time i went there in 2008 i uh, 2009 i went there for the first time this photograph is from 2011 though and uh, in this we see a little bit of water so it's more like a puddle and less of a tank in 2009 even this much was not there in all the even if you look at the architectural drawing you see there are three levels this is the british drawing there are three levels here you can see four levels why in british drawing we have three levels because during british era the fourth level was not excavated they had not gone down it was only when this when the india when indian government uh, asi in 1970s or 80s started clearing it they found out that there is actually a fourth level in 2020 it's all filled up with water and it's quite risky because this is way too deep each level is more than 10 feet high uh, rather 12 to 13 feet high so you can do the maths so what dalat khan did when dalat khan realized that ibrahim lodi might uh, remove him he came to delhi he established because Dol ibrahim lodi was ruling from agra so in delhi he established this and he tried to prove his might that i am very powerful person and i have my reach up till delhi so sitting in agra don't think that you can run away from me and i can still change who's ruling and who's not but then ibrahim lodi created some sort of fail safe mechanism and dalat khan realized that i cannot safeguard myself so dalat khan approached babar and if you read babar's memoirs in babar nama babar clearly mentions that there is some guy dalat khan who has been writing letters to me earlier i was traveling i could not respond to him but now i am responding to him he is inviting me to uh, lahore and that's when babar attacked lahore the agreement between or what dalat khan approached to babar was with, with was that you come to lahore you take over lahore make me the governor of lahore under your command and i'll give lahore to you i'll start reporting to you but babar came and babar took over lahore babar did not give it to dalat khan lodi and dalat khan was pushed to ludhiana and then dalat khan again approached babar he said you can't push me like this i am the one who invited you so then babar attacked all the way he came up till delhi and agra and he went beyond and that's when dalat khan was given some money and some small jagir but he could not come back to the imagine imagined uh, uh, glory that he wanted he could never get that back so this is last of his structures this is the mosque attached to it which uh, those masons living in there used as uh, a kitchen and hence all that black sludge on the ceiling the tomb of dalat khan because when he died he was buried over here this is the person who invited the moguls to india and he is the one responsible for the mogal empire in india okay uh, very quickly two three more uh, structures this is lohar hedi bauli in the village called lohar hedi which is now dwarka in delhi very small tiny structure recently found i saw this in 2012 and that's the year when it also appeared in news government of delhi immediately took action and this is how it appears now
Then we have one Bauli inside Arab Sarai, which is in Humayun's tomb. Again, a very small structure in old records. I found out that there used to be a mosque. Under that mosque, there were steps leading to a water tank. The mosque is all gone, but those steps are there and this is how it, it looks. This one is Hafiz Daud Ki Bauli, which is under the shrine of Kutubuddin Bakhtiar Kaki that I mentioned earlier. And this is the last Bauli built in Delhi. So uh, there is a graveyard behind uh, Khwaja Kaki's Darga within the complex. And inside that shrine, when you uh, look at the graveyard, you will not notice that there are steps going on. But as there are, you know, graves are in row. So one of the plot for graves is empty. And that much size, you have stairs leading down. So from one side, if someone is coming out of this Bauli, people who are standing outside might also get scared because it would appear that someone is coming out of a grave because it's just gravestones and in between hidden uh, these tiny steps leading down, which take you further down. There are two levels. The old door from the British era still exists. This is late Mughal, early British era. This is one of the dirtiest Bauli's reason being because people don't even know that this Bauli exists. There is an open space behind the Bauli. From all sides, it's covered. People cannot see what is on the other side. But uh, it is the Majlis Khan or the gathering hall of the shrine. And uh, almost every day, thousands of people come here. Whatever food they consume, they throw all the garbage beyond the wall. They don't know what is beyond the wall. They just think it's the garbage pit. They just toss it off. So every few days, the administration, they get on to clean this place. But it is it has become impossible to clean it. Uh, we need a totally different model to spread awareness about it. And people, they just don't listen. The hall on this uh, step well. Right now, the water level that you see, this is 70 feet of water. 70 feet. Above that, we have a hall. These pillars are from the British era. And if you look carefully, you might notice a little bulge in here because every day thousands of people stand on this roof and any day this can collapse 15 feet of this and then 70 feet below this. Everything will go down. A lot of people, uh, we are actually sitting on a disaster to happen. I've raised this concern. The uh, Darga committee has raised this concern. But again, the same problem. You need very strong political will to take action. And uh, you can understand this being a religious place that too uh, associated with a religion which is not favored these days too much. Uh, things are not good for this. And maybe one day when some big disaster will happen, government authorities will get up and do something about it. But until then, all we can do is pray that people are not hurt, people don't die. An old girder which reads 1898. This is when it was installed, one of the girders here. Last one, Tughlaqabad. We don't know whether it is a Bauli or a tank. There are two steppels left in the fort of uh, Tughlaqabad, but it's at a height. And uh, one of them is in a very bad shape. The other one is still in a good shape. People, you know, still go. It's all dried up. It's on the hill. So... This is from the, there used to be about 12 step wells in Tughlaqabad. Now only two are left or two have been discovered. Okay, I've got some questions now. I can move to that because uh, main portion is over. Matiya Mahal, I can quickly talk, not, nothing much about that. Uh, Jatin says excellent images, especially wide angle ones and that too in compromised ambient light. Do they allow DSLR at these ASI sites? Yes, they do allow DSLR. They don't allow videography. They allow photography. All these monuments are open. You can't do commercial photography. Uh, in my case, since book falls under a commercial category, so I had to take special permission. So I wrote a letter. I had the permission to shoot these temples. Uh, Ankur says, I may have missed a bit of the session, but are these baulis cleaned periodically? Maybe in some years by ASI government, the dirt, slime, etc. Also, when it is cleaned, it will be great photo opportunity. They are cleaned daily. Uh, the, the ones that are dried, they are cleaned daily because all you need to need is a broom. But ones that have water, they are not cleaned. And uh, you know, every few years, government might take some action to make sure that the structure doesn't collapse. Structure integrity is tested. So that's the only thing that is happening. Uh, proper cleaning, I still have to see where we're happening. However, uh, there are a couple of baulis which have been restored and cleaned properly. So 
but that's not by government that's by aga khan foundation government has only worked on red fort bauli properly in gujarat based one dslr is not being allowed uh, yeah that's that's uh, something like even i have experienced that but uh, luckily at one point they allowed me they didn't stop me uh, god is saying fantastic jab thank you uh, where azad is for the officer taken as prisoner of war from rangoon also in prison in the bauli of red fort no in red fort bauli only three generals sagal dillo shan was only three these three people were there radha is saying such uh, saying such informative talk thank you radha now i'll quickly end by this one mention matia mahal this is very special bauli because nobody knows about it that's the only thing that you can see about this bauli that's it no other photograph why because it's underground and there is a small window this is swel hashmi sahab trying to click a picture from this window i have also clicked this picture in records we have found this bauli and that's the only view we can get inside a street under we are under a building and we don't know anything more about this step well that's it while you are asking your questions or farooq wants to share something um, a list of stepwells if you wish to read uh, truly fascinating uh, you've taken us through how many centuries vikramjit i think about 6 well uh, we started with 12th century because altakmash bauli which is the gandak ki bauli was somewhere built in 1230s okay uh, 11 uh, not 12th century 30 12th century Okay. 13th century 1200 something yeah oh great so how did you get interested in this subject i just went to rajo ki bauli and then i asked people what this bauli is and what uh, uh, what the structure around it are and nobody was able to tell me anything they said this is a monument people come here people throw garbage do nobody takes care government does nothing and i'm like you are sitting here you live in this area you don't know about this and why are you blaming government Huh. so then i could have stood there i could have shouted like them or i could have done something myself i chose the letter i tr- started i tried to do it by myself read about these and more importantly the, when i tried to find information about these baulis you know when uh, uh, niyogi books approached me that okay you write a book i said okay i'll do it and it will take me 2 to 3 months because i know everything about baulis i've read a lot but when i started writing the book this is very small book that i've uh, prepared when i started writing it i realized that the information is not available perhaps baulis have always been con- taken for granted uh, or at least the information is not available in english one or two people were able to give me some info from some persian or urdu records so then i went and i learned urdu then i went and brushed up my persian and that's how i was able to find those old manuscripts read old uh, documents and prepare this tiny work